Hello again, welcome back to another 19V. I'm Margaret Shamu from Parsons School of Design at the New School. And today we have a presentation of the volume Picturing Russian Empire that came out last year at Oxford University Press. It will be presented by two of its editors, uh, Joan Neuberger from the University of Texas, Austin and Valerie Kivelson from the University of Michigan. Uh, the third editor, Sergei Kozlov, could not make it. Uh, we'll also be joined, though, by uh, three contributors, Willard Sutherland from the University of Cincinnati, Olga Mayorova from the University of Michigan, and Rosalind Polly Blakesley from the University of Cambridge. Our subisednik for the event will be Wendy Salmond from the University, uh, from Chapman University. So without any further ado, um, Joan. Actually, Val is going to begin. Perfect. It looks good. Good. Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted, on behalf of all of us, to thank the organizers for inviting us. It's especially exciting for me because I am, under no circumstances, a 19th centuryist, so <laughs> it's fun to crash the party. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes just to introduce the volume of I should say, I'm Valerie Kibbleson, um, introduced the volume co-edited with Joan Neuberger, who's here, and um, as Margaret said, with Sergei Kozlov in Tumen, Siberia. The volume, which you see before you, came really from a, a personal connection that Joan and Sergei and I wanted to do something big together. Uh, we all had a persistent interest in visuality and the agency of images. Joan and I had done some work on that together before, and we thought, given the way the field had been moving and the questions of interest to us, turning to the, the role that images play in imperial settings would be really productive, thinking about the circulation and changing and um, power of images within a broad imperial space. The, uh, the scope of the volume was always intended to be massive, and it is. Uh, it reaches from early Kiev and Rus, uh, Sergei is a, a medievalist and a Byzantinist, to 2022. It has 56 essays. Uh, as well as introductions and and explanations, so it's it's a major undertaking. We're very grateful to Oxford for putting it out in full color. The volume came at what I would call a kind of hinge point in thinking about empire. As as you all know, there's been really throughout the two thousands an effort underway to rethink empire. Uh, empire had taken on very ugly connotations in the late 19th and 20th centuries, but in the 2000s, it became clear that um, the nation state itself had a lot of dark sides. Uh, the nation state has a lot of coercive capacities for exclusion, for forcing homogeneity, for setting boundaries. And people like NYU's own Jane Burbank and Fred Cooper started pointing out that empire, which is based on structures of difference, actually has interesting uh, capaciousness, a capacity for incorporating, tolerating, even encouraging difference. And I think the moment when we undertook, started this volume, we and many of our contributors were thinking in those terms about the dynamism of empire, the diversity of empire. The book was at a, a late stage of production. Uh, I think it was through copy editing already when February 24th, 2022 rolled around. It shouldn't have come as a wake up call to us but it surely did. The invasion of Ukraine made us all wonder and doubt and, and to some extent, well, to a big extent, back away from this 
more celebratory tone. Not that it was ever celebratory. I don't want to. I don't want to make us sound like like um, cheerleaders for empire, but made us rethink that and remember that at heart, empire is always based on conquest, violence, and coercion, and. The timing was such that we were able to pull back our essays and our introductions and reformulate the entire volume uh, with that in mind. Uh, Joan added a piece on the on the invasion, um, which falls out of the 19th century scope of this this presentation, but I highly recommend. So uh, with that said, I want to turn the platform over to Joan, who's going to talk more about the substance of the volume. Thank you, Val. And um, thank you, everybody, for coming. We're glad, really, really glad to see so much interest in this volume. Um, I, I'm just going to sort of introduce a few ideas that are kind of o overarching in the volume that sort of arose from the 56 essays that it includes. Um, we especially, I mean, we did this sort of in, in um, a number of uh, a number of iterations. We drew conclusions and um, came up with new concepts that we think um, enlighten uh, ideas about all of our all of the concepts in our title: Russia, um, Empire, and Visuality. Um, and we, so we drew a few general conclusions and we came up with two new concepts that we think um, help organize ideas about the dynamism of images and about the role of images in, um, in history. Uh, our, our basic premise in this book is that images um, are dynamic objects that shape, help create shape and um, uh, that help create empire and shape experiences of empire. Uh, and the first concept that I want to talk about is what we call the pictosphere. Uh, a pictosphere, um, it became quite clear uh, from our essays that, if it wasn't clear before, that images don't aren't just dynamic, but they live in multiple, multi-layered um, worlds that are constantly changing. Images have an ability to fix meanings, but also to challenge them and transform them. Um, and uh, so no matter what the original purpose of an image is or its origins or its audience that um, they're sort of constantly, there's a constant ability to um, transform them. And that um, this takes place in a, a world that we, um, in, a, in a kind of sphere that we called the pictosphere. And that's a concept that we borrowed from Simon Franklin uh, in his wonderful book, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, The Graphosphere, which is about the this, this, this similar kinds of networks that words create when they are, as he puts it, encoded, disseminated, recorded, stored, um, and displayed. Um, and for us, networks of images, uh, I'm sorry, in a, in a holistic and non-hierarchical sphere. Um, and for us, this was a re really helpful concept for understanding all the ways in which images interact with each other, with new audiences, with various audiences in different parts of the country and in different parts of the world, um, and in the ways that images can both fix meanings and challenge them at the same time. So um, we have plenty of examples of uh, imperial imperatives of the violence and the coercion um, and the extraction of empire uh, and of um, the sort of unilateral center periphery. But what we discovered, especially uh, in, in looking at all these articles as a whole, is that even when that's the one of the strongest components of a, the life of an image, it's still always existing within multiple other spheres. And it's the interaction of all those different spheres that um, creates the experience of the Russian empire. Um, so that's 
the pictosphere. Second, I want to say that our Russian imperial pictosphere as a holistic, non-hierarchical, dynamic space challenges many of the, uh, especially many of the ideas that we have about the Russian Empire, especially binary ideas like center periphery, uh, metropole, colon a colony, and especially east-west um, in, in Russian history and in Russian culture. Um, and most interesting to us was the ways in which various um, contexts uh, revealed multiples, um, awarenesses of multiple multiples of ethnicity, multiples of geography, multiples of culture, um, and an awareness among producers, but also to some extent among uh, audiences of the ways that um, images exist amid many, many cultures at the same time. So, uh, and, and derive their meaning from these interactions with um, uh, hybrid identities and, um, and uh, uh, circulating images, um, the dynamism of circulation itself. Um, we, so we came up with the term amidness. Neither of us really like this word. Um, we spent many hours trying to come up with a different word, but nothing really quite captures the sense of images existing in multiple um, in multiple contexts at the same time. So each of the, uh, I'm not going to preempt what our other speakers are going to say about their projects, uh, their articles. Um, I'm happy to talk about either of these concepts later in question and answer time or about other essays um, that exemplify these concepts. Um, but I'm going to stop here now and turn it over to Willard. Thank you very much, Joan and Val. And thanks to everyone. Um, for the chance to talk a little bit about what, what was for me a very exciting, uh, if somewhat small, uh, project. Uh, uh, I know I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to be moving very quickly. Uh, let me just start by uh, giving you a, a brief pre of what, what you're looking at. Um, this image is in reality uh, a little over six feet tall, uh, just about four feet across. Uh, it's a gouache uh, watercolor. Um, we're not entirely sure when it was painted, but the presumption is that it's around the 1810s. And we're not exactly sure who painted it, but we have a big clue, a clue on the back of the work which you can only see when you take it off the wall, written in hand um, in a small corner is the inscription in Russian, Portret Sops, abbreviated, which for the time in the early 19th century implies that this is an autoportrait or a self-portrait. The work is in St. Petersburg, but unlike many other interesting pieces of art, it's not on display. In fact, um, to see it, you have to be somewhat tenacious or know a couple people, because it's actually hanging in an office. It hangs in a rather, I would say, humble uh, sector of uh, Russian academe in a room used by multiple scholars on the second floor of the Institute of Oriental Manuscripts, not far from the Winter Palace but hardly the hermitage. Uh, to get to see this work, you have to, um, uh, first of all, know that it's there. Uh, what I, I wanna do in my remarks is break down the painting a little bit. Uh, and that means telling you something of the individuals featured in the work, um, something of what I think it says about the relationship that created um, the image, and then the location, the place in which both the person and the relationship uh, came together and found its ultimate expression. The presumption when you look at it, uh, or at least this is a presumption that readily came to mind for me, uh, is that what we have before us is uh, uh, a, a white guy pretending to be Chinese. Um, a European dressed up a la chinoise, uh, an exotic display, uh, 
an orientalist snapshot of the sort that we're, uh, at least those of us working in, broadly in a European tradition might be familiar with, and that is uh, a kind of role playing of, of empire, an imperial relationship, but uh, one that perhaps doesn't seem terribly mysterious to us because uh, we've been exposed to us uh, to it in so many ways. In fact, um, what, what we see when we look a little bit more deeply into the image is indeed an imperial relationship. This is a work of empire, but it's not the uh, imperial relationship um, that um, we otherwise summarize in that idea of an orientalist display. Um, there's another imperial uh, dynamic at work here. It's a snapshot of a kind of Eurasian interaction between empires and imperial sensibilities. And in a very basic respect, it's a portrait of a relationship or some expression of the relationship between Russia and China in the early 19th century. So uh, what follows, I'm gonna uh, try and get into who's in front of us, uh, what that relationship consisted of and where the relationship that ultimately takes form in this painting is actually produced. Uh, so let me go to the next slide, if I could, uh, John, with your help. Okay. Um, who's the guy in the painting? The guy in the painting is uh, Nikita Yakovlich Bichurin. Um, that's his full given name, uh, but he's better known in the Russian tradition by his um, uh, ecclesiastical or monkish name of Yakimf or Hyacinth in English. He's a churchman, uh, a monk, um, and uh, in this uh, context, uh, he uh, is playing the special role in Russian monkdom of being the uh, head of the Russian spiritual uh, mission in Beijing, where he goes uh, as a relatively young man uh, in 1808. At that time, he's about 31 uh, years old. He'll live in Beijing for uh, almost 14 years years. He'll cart out with him crates upon crates of manuscripts, maps, uh, books. And for the rest of his career, uh, he'll never leave uh, the empire again. He'll get close again to the Chinese border, but he'll never return to Beijing. But he will make China the cause of his life. And he ultimately will establish himself as a kind of founding father of Russian Sinology working in a uh, relatively comfortable spot in the um, so-called Asiatic Department of the Russian Foreign Ministry, translating Chinese works and instructing Russian students in Chinese, and ultimately, in effect, turning his uh, relatively youthful period of exposure to China into a lifelong ticket to uh, immense standing within the empire in his time and also great renown in Europe, in part because of this lived experience, that lived authority that he brought with him from having spent time there. <clears throat> the um, relationship that he was a part of is a Sino-Russian relationship uh, that was if formally begun in the late 17th century uh, as the two empires kind of crash into each other in the broader borderland of the uh, Amur uh, River. And uh, what comes from that encounter is an agreement you know, or a series of agreements that ultimately codify a way of getting along. And the Russian spiritual mission is a part of that codification. Uh, it exists in Beijing to take care of a small group of uh, Russian Orthodox believers from the border area who have been relocated to Beijing and now uh, deserve, according to the agreement between the imperial states, a certain amount of religious support or succor. And the Russian mission headed by a Russian a churchman uh, is designed to provide that support. And that brings me to the place. <laughs> this map is a, um, um, a document of the 1840s, so somewhat after Bichurin's time uh, in the city, but it's a fantastic image for zeroing in on exactly where and how he did his work. I guess what I want to draw attention to here is you see the two, uh, two red shapes there at the, at the bottom center of the map. Um, um, the top uh, squarish thing and then a kind of trapezoid rectangular thing beneath it. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I guess what today we'd call, for lack of a better word, downtown uh, Beijing. Uh, everything around it is Beijing in, in our time. 
Um, but in that time, uh, this was the uh, absolute imperial center of the show. And the small box that's in the center of the top box, that is the, um, um, the uh, sort of imperial city. And then the smaller box that's within that, that uh, central box is the forbidden city. The big box that runs around um, on the top, that one, yeah. That is the so-called inner city of uh, the original uh, Meijing, uh, sorry, Ming era uh, design of the, of, the, of the capital. And the Russian mission was located in two spots within that square. Can you go back to the, the other slide? Uh, two spots within that square. One is in the top right-hand corner of the square and the other in the bottom uh, center of the square. If we go to the next image, sorry, next image, um, this is the so-called Beiguan, the northern uh, uh, sort of compound of the mission, located uh, next to what is now um, uh, the second ring road of central Beijing, the old uh, gate of Anding Men. And you can see the, the wall uh, on, on, on the far edge of that, of that picture. This is where a small group of Russian monks uh, uh, and uh, sort of... Uh, uh, um, um, uh, so, sort of uh, assisting staff uh, lived usually for at least 10 years at a time. And this was where the relationship uh, uh, between Russia and, uh, and China was sort of forged, at least on the, the, the Russian side. And this is where Bichurin uh, sort of established himself as an observer and uh, uh, an eager, um, uh, I guess, uh, interlocutor between his Russian world and the world of China right around him. Now, I'm going to go to the next image. Um, you get to it? Good. Uh, the principal role of the mission was to tend to the religious needs of the Albazinsi, the, this, uh, this small uh, Russian Orthodox population relocated from the border area to the city. Um, by Bichurin's time in the early 19th century, this small group uh, was profoundly affected by uh, 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 blending, intermarrying with Chinese uh, families uh, and was, uh, you, you know, for lack of a better term, a wholly sinicized uh, population. The real link to uh, Russia was through uh, this, uh, the, the communal practice of church going and uh, a kind of identification with the Orthodox faith. But Bichurin uh, was a rather uh, lackadaisical <laughs> overseer of religious uh, uh, instruction and religious uh, education in, in more broadly. And um, he spent most of his time uh, actively engaged with the Chinese world around him, learning Chinese, um, copying Chinese manuscripts, and committing himself to uh, be a kind of firsthand, not just observer, but a kind of a deep, uh, deeply felt interpreter of the culture around him. And that brings me to the portrait. Can you go to the next image? Willard, yeah. we're, we're running a little low on time. We're a little low on time. Okay, so uh, uh, just let me get to it. Um, uh, Bichurin appears to have had um, uh, some uh, background or some talents, at least, as an artist. And we know this from some of the works that he brought out with him from China, in which he lent his own hand to a copying drawings that were part of these materials, such as this ethnographic, what we would call for lack of a better term, an ethnographic album of some of the peoples of the border area. This makes it plausible that he is indeed the, the author of a self-portrait, the portrait that we're talking about. And let's go to the next image so that you can see a breakdown of the qualities of this image. <clears throat> Here too, if we zero in on some of the elements of the image, assuming that he is indeed uh, the, the, the author of the work, we can see this at fine attention to detail and to representing him as someone in, in between these cultures. But it's not a make-believed uh, 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 position uh, of in-betweenness. It's actually a formalized position of in-betweenness. This uh, Chinese or Qing uh, uh, imperial dress that he's wearing was, was uh, required of the members of the mission. They were formally paid by the Qing uh, emperor 
for their services intending to his subjects of the Russian faith. And in the image, by zeroing in on some of the detailed aspects, we can tell or can sense a little bit more fully uh, Bichurin's, uh, I think, both fascination with the culture that he lived in and his commitment to representing it as fully or in as much detail as he could. If you look at the uh, various details of the uh, image, like the, the way in which the roundels of the kaftan are captured, or the individual horse hairs on uh, his bamboo hat, or the buttons, or the clogs, all of these details, including even the faintest strap of the hat around his chin, um, communicate his, uh, I think, uh, both uh, driven impulse to be uh, a, a, an exacting realist artist um, and his commitment to representing the culture he lived in for, um, uh, I guess, himself in the first instance, but maybe more symbolically for the Russian world he was representing. And since I'm already out of time, I'll just go to the last image. Um, Today, you can't find anything left of the Russian um, a compound, uh, the so-called northern compound, the Beguan. That's the site of the contemporary Russian embassy, at least on part of it. But this is an image from the 1930s that shows you something of the vastness of the space that we're talking about. In, um, uh, in this image, it's largely devoid of as many buildings as there might have been around it in an earlier time because so much was lost during the uh, uh, Boxer Rebellion at the turn of the 20th century. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you, sorry for going over. Thank you, Willard. Uh, next up, Val, you're gonna share Olga's slides. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to contribute to the volume and to contribute to today's, uh, to today's discussion. In the late 1860s, as the Russian army embarked on the conquest of Central Asia, shocking images of Asian people cutting off human heads gained unprecedented prominence in representations of Russia's new colony, soon to be called Turkestan. In Russia, as elsewhere at that time, the legitimacy of colonialism rested on the notion of a civilizing mission. Russia saw itself as part of Europe and therefore in the vanguard of historical progress. And what could resent this self-serving construct more graphically than depicting barbarous Asians cutting off human heads? The motif of the severed heads had emerged at the very first exhibition organized by the government in 1869 to introduce Turkestan to, this, uh, to the St. Petersburg public. Covering that exhibition, the press unanimously praised paintings produced by a young Russian painter, soon to become a celebrity, Vasily Verishagin, who had accompanied the Tsarist army in Central Asia. His canvas after victory, please show it now, um, occupied an important place on the, in the exhibition. Designed to produce a chilling effect on the viewer, after victory not only foregrounds the severed head of a vanquished Russian, but also depicts two living natives who take gruesome pleasure in scrutinizing it. Central Asians collected those horrif horrifying trophies on the battlefields in pursuit of gifts and honors promised to them in exchange by their hands. That's what many Russian um, reporters uh, wrote about, including Vereshchagin. Within this context, we can understand why the two figures on the canvas are shown peering at the seventh head so critically. To be a source of income or promotion, it has to be cut off perfectly. Vereshchagin clearly regarded the beheading business as a quintessential symbol of Asian savagery. In his subsequent exhibitions, he displayed after victory as part of a larger series of canvases that, te that te tells a lot, a much fuller story of the Savage Heads afterlife. Next slide, please. 
collected from the battlefield, they are brought to the feet of a powerful ruler who receives them in his palace in the painting they present profit. In another canvas, they celebrate, next slide please, seven heads are placed atop tall spears in a vast square where the Asian crowd celebrates their victory. To draw a sharp line between us, the Russians, the civilizers, and them, the barbaric Asians, Vereshagin resorted to dramatic visual contrast sometimes. Next slide, please. For example, he coupled after victory with the mirror image after defeat, in which a Russian soldier surrounded by multiple Asian corpses calmly smokes a pipe showing no interest in his fallen enemies. Such binary thinking pervaded the works of many Russians. <clears throat> Next two slides, please. In their representations of Turkestan, the beheading theme stood as the most powerful tool for othering Central Asians. Thus, Nikolai Karazin, a painter, writer, and military officer, often depicted natives busy with that horrific business. Yet this contrast, which seemed so persuasive and instrumental, soon turned out to be fragile and ambiguous. When Virishagin began to show his canvases in England, Austria, and France, his visual narratives of Central Asia took on a new interpretation one that does not sit comfortably with the Orientalist binaries and indeed questions the dividing line between the colonizers and the colonized. An English art critic covering the London International Art Exhibition in 1872 bluntly declared Virishagin's work, I quote, an act of barbarism. Even though Virishagin's artistic skills were indisputable, as all British reviews of the exhibition acknowledged, this critic claimed that the Russian artist lacked the aesthetic tact and refined style that made it possible for his French counterpart, and actually his French mentor as well, the Orientalist painter Jerome, to depict even the most monstrous violence without offending delicate modern sensibilities. Next slide, please. The English critic found himself particularly unsettled by after defeat with its portrayal of a Russian soldier who, I quote, standing close to the blood-strained corpses in a heap feels aloof and unflappable. He looks like I continue the quote, he looks like a butcher and lights his pipe with a grim worthy of a harem. Thus the, the Tsarist soldier, an agent of the European civilizing mission in the eyes of Russians, was relegated to the position of a colonized savage. In the rest of my paper, I show, and I believe I don't have the time to do that in detail now, but um, in the rest of my paper, I show how Virishagin and his circle embraced the argument about the painter's barbarism. Some of the paintings that Virishagin completed after the first Turkestan exhibition in St. Petersburg began to reveal ambiguities in the imperial vision. Next slide, please. Thus, his famous apotheosis of war palpably destabilizes the metropolitan colony binary that he had so vividly asserted previously. Featuring a pyramid of skulls set in a typical Central Asian space, the painting, as Virishagin himself explained, refers to Tamerlane and the devastating effect of his wars. But on the frame of the canvas, Virishagin ascribed a dedication to all great conquerors, past, present, and future. Conspicuously disregarding cultural boundaries, the phrase renders atrocities universal and refrains from ethnic distinctions binding all conquerors 
through blood and violence. Employing the same pictorial motif of the severed head that he had presented as, as a defining feature of Central Asia's savagery, Berishengin now strips it of any ethnographic traits. His mound of skulls is allegorical rather than real. With this dramatic shift in the rendering of the severed head theme, Rishagin expressed profound ambivalence towards the construction of civilization boundaries between us and them. And in the very concluding portion of my paper, I demonstrate how Tolstoy in Hadji Murat radically disrupted the conventional meaning of beheading as a symbolic marker of the Muslim other. And it might be that the Rishagin to some extent, Berishagin's painting, to some extent, um, influenced that um, turn, but uh, and that aspect of Tolstoy's uh, Haji Murat. But it also might be there are might be many other reasons why he had do he did, did so, including some intertextual uh, nuances that I'm not um, exploring here. In Tolstoy's Hadji Murat, the distribution of roles between Russians and local Muslims is completely reversed. The de decapitation of Hadji, Murat's, of Hadji Murat is committed by a Tsarist soldier, even though that soldier is a Caucasian Muslim. Then it is the Russian authorities who dispatch an ethnic Russian military officer, a sort of, certain Kamenev, uh, to travel from one Caucasian Muslim village to another, displaying Hadji Murat head, Hadji Murat's head. Thus, the idiom of beheading an enemy and then displaying the severed head has come full circle. Tolstoy turns into uh, turns it into a tool for condemning the Tsarist regime and depicting it as the most uncivilized of. I don't have the time to elaborate more on that, but if you have questions, I will be glad to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Holly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you all today. Um, my chapter for Picturing Russian Empire takes as its focus Vasily Surikov's Yamak's conquest of Siberia that I'm showing you here. Depicting the Cossack leader's decisive battle with Kuchim Khan's forces in 1582, Surikov's painting exemplifies the subjugating codes of colonialist discourse. A strong diagonal composition ensures that Yermak's troops are carefully articulated in the foreground, while the opposition recessed behind the icon-bearing standards of the invading forces is reduced in places to an amorphous, depersonalized mass. The background is obfuscated as well, resisting identification of this as a civilized space. Purchased by Alexander III, the painting was a resounding success in the heartlands of empire. It won Surikov the rank of academician in the Imperial Academy of Arts. But the artist's relationship with Siberia was complex and multifaceted, and it gives us rich opportunity to explore an intersection of empire, visuality, and nostalgia that is deeply inflected by Surikov's negotiation of Russia's colonial past. Next slide, please. So much has been made of Surikov's attachment to Siberia, where he spent the first 20 years of his life. Born the son of a civil servant, he studied with a local artist using the medium of watercolor to explore ways in which the landscape could encapsulate both the prosaic and the sublime. This made sufficient impact for the governor of Krasnoyarsk to send examples of Surikov's work to the Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg. Next slide, please. Receiving an encouraging response, Surikov set off for the capital in December 1868, matriculated at the Academy in 1870, and was soon producing works like his luminescent Monument to Peter the Great, as well as the sort of history paintings that the Academy espoused. Next, please, Joan. In the summer of 1873, though, Surikov embarked on his first trip back to Siberia, which fueled 
a very different set of aesthetic and artistic concerns. Notably, he resumed his work in watercolour to test his responses to the steppe and its indigenous people. This reprisal of watercolour begs consideration through a theoretical lens, as it signalled a return to the modes of execution which he had deployed before his academic training began. And of relevance here, what I found really useful is Svetlana Boim's dyad of restorative and reflective nostalgia, a dyad that she, of course, developed to explore attitudes to a lost Soviet past, but which I found useful in theorizing Surikov's return to a medium and a method at odds with the academic training in which he'd been immersed for almost four years. Particularly telling is this um, comparison. Sorry, next slide, please. Particularly telling is this comparison of two landscapes painted in 1862 and 1873. Here, the artist uses a similar palette and composition to reprise a formula of modest vernacular buildings set against hills or mountains and cloudy skies. This creates a continuity of effect all the more striking in light of the decade that separates the two works. So this recalls to earlier activities and practices meets Boehm's definition of restorative nostalgia, that sense of wanting to go back to old ways. Next slide, please. But Surikov's verbal utterances of nostalgia for his Siberian haunts are invariably more reflective than restorative, in the sense that they evince a sense of longing or algea without a desire to restore the lost home. This was particularly evident when in 1877, he moved from Petersburg to Moscow and attributed his happiness there to the ways in which it reminded him of Krasnoyarsk. And I'll just read part of this quote, the most relevant bit. Moscow had something that was much more reminiscent of Krasnoyarsk for me, especially in winter. You would walk in the street at twilight, turn into a side street and suddenly find something familiar and similar to what you see in Siberia like forgotten dreams, scenes of my childhood and then my youth came to my mind more and more. I began to recall different types and costumes and I felt drawn to all of this as something native and indescribably dear. So my point is that Surikov's articulation of nostalgia during and after his trip home in 1873 operates on both sides of Svetlana Boim's coin. His, his visual responses required the restoration of an earlier practice, so his watercolour landscapes, while his written statements were reflexive and contemplative, rather than aiming to recuperate a former world. This proves instructive as we trace the development of Yermak. And brace here, because I'm an art historian to my core, and I've got quite a few images to show. So Joan, are you ready? So this trajectory began in 1888, when, following the death of his wife, the grief-stricken Surikov gathered up his children and moved back from Moscow to Krasnoyarsk. Traveling widely both that year and during return visits to Siberia during four of the five subsequent summers, he made myriad sketches of landscapes and people of different ethnic types in preparation for his epic canvas. Establishing a conceptual framework for these studies is challenging. At one moment, Surikov revels in a local subject returning the invader's gaze in a forceful visual metaphor of fighting back, a dynamic that confirms how central the actual process of looking is to his final work. Indeed, a viewer of the finished painting commented on the individualization of Kuchum's forces and Surikov's reluctance to typologize. So in Surikov's words, he wrote, the Siberians are not very typical. They look more like photographs than types. But at other times, next slide please, Joan, the artist resorts to stereotypical hierarchies of the colonizer triumphant over the colonized. This is powerfully evident in his compositional sketches, which are many varied and revelatory. In an early sketch of 1891, Kuchum's forces barely figure though their territory features as a civilized space with a skyscraper of elegant spires and buildings in the background. Next, please. Another sketch gives the Siberian troops much more space and attention 
and significantly, there is clear water between them and the Cossacks. Next, please. Over the next year, though, that expanse of water is reduced to bring the two armies into closer proximity, creating a claustrophobic effect that projects a sense of Kuchum's imminent defeat. Next, please. Surikov seems to have been sufficiently satisfied with this arrangement to develop it into two increasingly detailed sketches in 1892. But other, undated sketches reveal the extent of his vacillations. As late as 1895, next please, he again extends the gap between the two opposing sides. Next please. But he then brings them back together in a congested and frenetic sketch that paved the way for the final painting completed that same year. Next please, Joan. The development of Yermak thus underlines how complicated an artist's engagement with the colonized other could be. Presaged by nostalgic images of Siberian landscapes and inhabitants, and developed through sketches in which the subaltern crowd waxed and waned, it compels us to consider how frameworks of empire might allow for different subjectivities, and in turn, how these enable questions of visual as much as political combat to take center stage. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Polly. Thank you, um, Joan and Val. Um, I will now introduce, uh, once again, Wendy Salman for our uh, Sebi Sednik. Thanks so much, Margaret. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a it's it's quite a cultural event, I think, in the 19V field, but especially in the 19V art history field, that we're um, having this opportunity to talk about this book in particular, uh, Joan and Val. Um, and uh, just hearing first, just a, a few words about these three uh, exemplary um, essays that have come out of 56 um, chapters in your book. Each one of you, um, Polly, Willard and Olga, have shown what it is to engage really closely with images in their own right and not use them as illustrations, but use them as really complex speaking organisms that we never really come to the end of knowing them, but we try. Um, so some of the words that uh, uh, came to mind, somehow the word forensic, I find kind of useful here, the, uh, that the unpacking, the dissecting without really, with a really fine scalpel, without really being quite sure what you're going to get to in the end. I mean, these, it's quite a subjective quality. Um, uh, in betweenness, and as opposed to binary, is a theme I think that washes right through the book, but particularly in Olga and Willard's um, papers and your way of resisting or calling out the tremendous desire to be binary, to see things in black and white terms and to see why that and how that can be an imperial thing. Um, uh, and Polly, in your in your paper, I thought the the sort of unfolding of, a, of an artist's conceptual process and the personal and the public interfolding at the same time to go from the image of dream and childhood memory, so tremendously personal and subjective, mm -hmm. and then to see an artist who's creating um, a work over time, which is so much about acceptable public statements through the visual. And I think each of you just showed how close contextualized reading is what we need here. Mm -hmm. And these are three of, we need thousands of these readings, actually, I think. <laughs> there is no end to the work that we all together have to do. Um, so what, before I heard your, these three presentations, um, I had gone back to the introduction to the book and I hope you don't mind if really what, what I'd like to just say for the next few minutes has to do with the project as a whole, because I think it's tremendously significant. Um, so I remember back in 2008 when Joan and Val, you brought out um, your first sort of iteration of this project, this massive, enormous, ambitious project, which was called um, Picturing Russia. And so one can really feel the presence of Picturing Russia inside or preparatory to Picturing Russian Empire. Um, I've used that book or, or chapters in that book constantly for undergraduate teaching 
it's the most perfect example of how to get students to think about how they can think about images in a much more nuanced way than they've been taught. Um, it's a wonderful, um, they're wonderful lessons in visual literacy, but also contextual seeing. Um, one of my favorite essays in that book is Nancy Coleman's piece on the cap of Monomark. It's such a perfect puzzle of meanings that needs to be decoded if we're going to really understand how it's been used in a highly politicized way. Um, and I remember at the time, um, the excitement that I felt as someone with a very strong binary habit myself, because I was taught binary skills, um, to just see the simple move from a linear way of thinking about the unfolding of meaning, the linear chronology of the slideshow, to the idea of the cluster. Um, I think in the 2000s, this was quite a novel thought that you might think not left to right, beginning to end, but things clustering around central notions. And I think the way that book already was organically growing was had the had the germs of the ideas that are now come to fruition, I think, in a really fantastic way in this book. Um, so here we are at 2024, 16 years later, and some of these ideas are still intact. You can see them growing, bur bursting out, expanding out of that first volume. Um, uh, but of course, as you said, uh, Val, in your introduction, I mean, the trauma of this for you as editors must have been extreme to have a book all ready to go and then a war happens and you have to rethink Empire, the very heartland of your book. Um, and I think you have managed that in a really subtle way without falling back into sort of the chaos of a binary way of thinking. You sort of held on to your, um, your, um, your groundedness realizing that it's not really going to work to go, to go back to the evil empire, <laughs> that the project I think you're undertaking, which is to see empire is endlessly complex. And it seems to be about us and them, but it's not only about us and them. That's the whole, the whole problem when it becomes us and them. Um, so I think this book does this amazingly. Um, so the two, what I noticed, um, I'm really fascinated by the imagery and the metaphorical way in which you have presented um, in your framing introduction and in your conclusion, um, Joan, uh, in the 2008 book, you used this word um, galaxy really to talk about primarily about visual studies, that the visual studies is quite an up and coming field. When you came out with that book, um, you mentioned it um, as providing a galaxy of diverse and often conflicting ideas, points of views, and images, that there's no closure. It's all about um, um, diverse ways of going at things. But the idea of a galaxy really struck me because I think it perfectly aligns with the feeling of the book as a point of departure. So when I think galaxy, I'm sort of looking up at the universe thinking, wow, look at that out there, isn't that? The cosmos, it's so huge. And you had sort of picked out some stars or some... <laughs> comets in that galaxy and there they were put together in clusters for the first time without mm -hmm. and now you've come to, to to this book and the terms you're using the metaphors you're using they're kind of similar but they're not because they're tracking the way our collective thinking has tracked so um mm -hmm. the most wonderful term you use i think is to think of empire as a networked what have i got here a networked um a networked goodness, goodness me, I've lost it. <laughs> it was such a good term, and now I've lost it here. A networked space, I think, that the idea of the web, of the network, of the inter interfacing and interacting units, to is just. Of course, it's an idea of our time. It's a it's a truism of our time that that's how we're learning to think. But intellectually, I don't think we're fully on board with thinking that way in our work, and we tend to fall back on the easy structures that we've used in the past. And I think the way this book hangs together is precisely in this networked space um, as a way of mapping out the empire. Um, so the two things finally that really came to mind for me, I mean, almost in a visceral way, one's really obvious in the world of the, you know, the web that we live in, couldn't get Google Earth out of my mind. And when Willard said he wanted to show his map and zoom in, and zoom out so he could take us in and out of the of Beijing. 
oh, I so much wanted to be able to do that. But in my mind, I was doing it. So we know what it is to move in and out of spaces. Um, but the image that really came to mind for me, and I don't know if this will seem too fanciful, but all those times when I've been in a plane at night and I'm coming back to Los Angeles over the mountains, ranges, and you go across these flatlands and it's completely dark, completely black. And then every so often down below, there'll be this tiny cluster of lights. And you know that that's a city or a farm or a village or a country road. And that's what your book feels like to me. It's like the empire is like this vast terrain that we can't see. And the 56 essays in your book, finally, I think, are actually tracking habitations and densities of being in that imperial space in our minds. Um, and so your 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 term amidness, which you are not very happy with, maybe as a term, it's a bit clunky, but as planting an idea, it's fantastic because it captures that sense of like roads and trajectories and linkages between one part of an imperial idea and another part of an imperial idea without ever getting to the end of it. And I think finally, that's what I feel of in a good way. Like we're never going to arrive at the end of this picturing empire. But your another idea you've got, which is really beautiful, is this one of density. That um, one of the reasons we know more, so much more about some things than, than about other things, is we have a greater density of visual imagery at that site. Like there are more. That town is bigger there, and there's like just one house down here. And so I, it seems to me that that's what you're doing in this picturing and networking and mapping way, you're populating or beginning to populate a vast, endless terrain, which is how we try and think about empire. And there's just so much endless room for all of us to get in there. So I I think it's just one of the great um, groundbreaking books in our, in our collective fields. So I want to thank you for it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Wendy. That was that was really terrific. And um, I'll just point out that Willard has put the map uh, that he mentioned, a link to that in the chat, so you can explore it in your own time. I've also placed links to the Picturing Russia and Picturing Russian Empire uh, publications, um, if you want to look at those later on. Um, but for now, um, we can just open up the discussion. Um, I'll just remind you that if you'd like to um, uh, if you'd like to speak, you'll uh, have to either raise your virtual hand or your physical hand, um, and you'll be recognized to speak so that um, Sasha or someone at NYU can um, can unmute can can allow you to unmute yourself. So, any would would anyone like to respond to Wendy's comments, or if anyone has any questions, please go ahead. Yeah, Joan. Um, I, I just want to say one word, um, Wendy, to thank Wendy for this um, really interesting connecting between these two projects, which uh, is really good for Val and me because we don't always always do that exactly. Um, and also, I, I just I love your image of the night sky and the clusters of lights as a metaphor for really almost any kind of knowledge because it's always partial, especially I think of my colleagues in medieval history who have far fewer documents than we do trying to draw connections between mm -hmm. even smaller clusters. Um, but I, I really love that idea. And I, I love the um, the way that it uh, il illustrates, if I can use that rejected term, the way that it illustrates the idea of amidness, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, thank you. I, I also, I have a question for Willard. I know he didn't really get to talk about this because he, he was talking about other things. But one of the things that I think is really important about your essay is um, Father Hyacinth's own personal uh, ethnic background and borderline, uh, borderland um, uh, upbringing. And if we have time, if, you know, I don't know how many questions there are, but I think we should go to other people's questions. But um, if we have time, if you just say a word or two about that would be great. Well, perhaps, Willard, maybe you could say a word or two about it now while we're waiting for those questions to appear. So again, okay. oh, so we have a question coming so from Allison Hilton next, and you'll be unmuted um, in a moment. But Willard, please respond. 
Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank, thanks uh, for the other wonderful uh, presentations and Wendy for your comments. Uh, the the point that uh, Joan was sort of drawing you to make was that uh, Bichurin himself, uh, Yakim, he was not an ethnic Russian, but uh, but a Chuvash, uh, born in a Chuvash village in, uh, you know, what, what we commonly refer to as the middle Volga region, a broader zone of uh, Kazan province. And uh, it's very likely that he grew up uh, speaking Chuvash um, and was only really introduced to a uh, a larger Russian world um, as a as a as a young teenager when he uh, traveled to Kazan and ultimately enrolled in religious school there, uh, and ultimately, of course, he stepped into Orthodoxy and embraced it. Uh, uh, ultimately, I think becoming highly Russianized in the process, but. Uh, I, I imagine some, somewhere along the line in his um, uh, cultural in-betweenness as a, as a Chuvash Russian in Beijing, he could see a kind of continuum in his own um, uh, journey uh, between cultures from uh, the mixed cultural zone of the Volga to uh, his place in the complicated cross-cultural relationship between Russia and China, which is even more, um, uh, I guess, uh, diverse than I was letting on because uh, many of the members of that original uh, Albazinsi community were not themselves ethnic Russians. They were Buryats or, or Tungus or Evenk is the term we used to describe or the, for the ethnonym today. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were broadly described as Russians, but that itself was a simplification. So there's an awful lot of diversity going on in this particular part of the amidness of the book. <laughs> Wonderful, Thanks. thank you so much. Um, so we have a question from Allison, and then we'll have uh, Masha Chlanova. Okay, thank you. I have a request and then a brief question. I th think it would be very useful if Wendy would allow this to have at least a summary of her remarks somehow posted on the Shara website or on the 19V mm -hmm. website. And it's something that you, you could think about doing. But I found in a five minute span of time, some very big, good ideas. And I, you're one of those people who um, have clearly thought about yanking us out of our learned and habitual ways of thinking and seeing if we can go fly across the mountains and so forth. Um, anyway, I found it terrifically useful. So please, maybe Margaret and uh, Nikita and others uh, consider that um, in due course. Could I ask one question now? Of course. Yes. Okay, this is for Polly. And it's not a good question, really, I'm afraid. But Whenever I've shown that painting, um, kids want to see which one is Yermak. And I've always said, well, I don't know. I don't, I think it's um, on purpose that they are identified as Cossacks through their gear and their icons and stuff. But we're almost part of that crowd and in a real crowd, of fighters, we wouldn't we wouldn't necessarily see anything more clearly than these people did. So thank you for your talk too. I I good notes. Thank you, Alison. Um, you've raised a really important point, and actually, Surikov wrote about his struggles with differentiating individuals from crowds, um, both with respect to this painting and also two others. So the Bayarina Marozova um, was one of the early ones, which where he talked about his sort of vacillations about how much prominence to give to an individual. Um, and I, I've looked briefly in one of the bits of the piece I wrote for Picturing Russian Empire, which I want to expand is I, I looked at his awareness of people like Thomas Carlyle in Britain, um, which you know Russians were aware of and had very sort of different views about, and the idea of the great man, the, you know Carlyle's never-ending thesis that that history is is down to a sequence of great men and they were always inevitably 
great men. Um, and Surikov um, seems to be veering away from some other major cultural figures in Russia at the time by by at least testing the ground for alternative ways of conceptualizing these historical events, which were more cohesive and more collaborative and more sort of, uh, you know, that they, they, they involved multiples rather than single great leaders. So I think it's a brilliant question because he himself was also thinking about that. And we know from his sketches, um, I've shown you a tiny fraction of the sketches that he produced for this painting. And we know, know from his sketches that he early doors um, tried a different formula where Yermak was very um, significantly profiled. You could instantly identify who he was rather than having to take a little bit of time to work out which of the figures he was. So thank you for your observations. Thank you so much, Polly. That's great. Um, Masha, can you unmute yourself or not yet? Yes. Great. Hello. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. And I am very happy to discover the book. I didn't realize it came out in the new edition. So I'm your very grateful um, audience and future reader. And one thing I discovered now, also just now looking at the table of contents is that it includes the, your, your many, many chapters include the revolutionary era and the Soviet era and, and the post-Soviet era. And I wanted to ask at what point and how you came to, whether this was the original intent or when you decided to do it um, at a certain point, how this idea came and what, how you um, take its implications of is this, a continued empire, just how that fits within the scope of the project. Thank you. Um, <laughs> how did we decide that we wanted to cover every chr chronological period? It actually goes back to the first book, really, um, which uh, I think when we started it, it was going to be somewhat more contain uh um restricted but we decided that we really wanted to cover a much larger you know the whole the sort of whole period um from the beginning of anyway from whatever we did from the beginning to the end um but I, I i think we never really we never really questioned it from the beginning of this project i think we always considered that we wanted to begin as early as we possibly could and continue past um uh, you know, obviously past the collapse of the Soviet Union to the post-Soviet period. Uh, in terms of whether we considered all of those empires, um, certainly the, period, the early period isn't even an empire, but it is part of the history of this region. Um, so it's important in that sense. And it's also, if the first two essays are very much about the ways in which whatever we want to, whatever it was called, Rus, was situated among empires and that that shaped what it became. Um, so, um, Val is, um, uh, um, I mean, I can talk about the history, the historiography of the books, but Val is, is much more um, qualified to talk about the ways in which we have considered this whole region imperial, always, or in some Yeah, ways. I think it, I mean, the question was directed to the, the later era, the, the post, the Soviet, post-Soviet, sure, but sure, sure, sure. I think going to the pre-Russian part really is, is of a piece because we were interested in the formation of empire, which means looking at areas that were at times under Russia, at times had absolutely nothing to do with Russia, at times bore the legacy of having been associated with Russia. And so that broad sweep allowed us to think about empire not as an accomplished thing or a kind of manifest destiny, but as a historical creation that that has its zigs and its zags. Um, so I think intellectually, the full sweep made sense to us. But I think also, as Joan said, that's just what we set out to do, given that we had a medievalist and early modernist and a modernist among our, our editors. It's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add that, um, I, I mean, I'm certainly very glad that we went into the post-Soviet period because not only did empire 
rear its ugliness, its worst ugliness again, in ways that are inescapable. But um, also most of those essays are about dealing with the legacy of empire. So it's very much an important part. And this is really just expanding on what Val said. It's really very much an important part of the history of this whole region. So I don't know, did we answer your question? Yeah, to that. Yes, I think I'm, I'm, I just, um, I guess I'm still processing this. I, I look forward to reading the intro essays that explain this more. I'm just, you know, I guess sensitive to the implication that of course the Soviet Union was an empire. And of course the Soviet, the post-Soviet is still an empire. I don't think it's a, it's a given for everyone. Um, so, um, you know, coming to it from, as you did um, from the empire itself, that revolutionary moments is it an empire there is no soviet union yet so you know just i'm I'll, I'll think through this i think it's rich and i think it's interesting and and i'm glad these essays are there and i'm glad that it's um i just wanted to so thank you yes i, I just wanted to hear a little bit more from where you came from to this i think well, i'll just say that we addressed we addressed the 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 issue of what is an empire really throughout the book i think some of the essays do and then we have introductions to each chronological section. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure we addressed it as fully as we possibly could, but it's already quite a long book. And I feel like we really did try to, um, to acknowledge that these are, that these are issues. I think it's a great, it's, it's putting the question on the table, which is very important and I look forward to reading that. Thank you. <laughs> Good, thanks. Great. Okay, um, Ksenia, we will unmute you, or we will ask you to unmute, and um, there we go. You'll be able to speak momentarily. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for this wonderful discussion um, to the editors and writers in Picturing Russian Empire. It's close by as I finish my dissertation. Um, but uh, my question today is about a theme I picked up on while reading the various wonderful essays, and it was really helpful, particularly to think about this in terms of Polly Blakesley's, Blakesley's and uh, Will Willard Sunderland's talks today, because my question is about clothing, which comes up in so many of the essays here. There are hats, there are military uniforms, and really as an art historian, Thinking about the empire and its diversity and representation, it's one of the first things I go to when approaching visual material and thinking about identity, right? Um, because if we just kind of confine ourselves to studying the physiognomies of the subject picture, there's a tricky ethical territory there. Um, but I also find myself depending on clothing too much. And I think uh, Willard Sunderland's talk gave a really good example of how clothing can kind of subvert these um, representations of identity in that very time. Um, so I wanted to ask you all about how you deal with this preponderance of clothing. I know that Christine Rand's book on the Empire's News of Clothes is extremely helpful, um, but moving forward in terms of specifically producing more scholarship that deals with issues of diversity and difference in Russia's empires. Um, how do we approach difference ethically and also deal with the importance of clothing and one's kind of material surroundings um, in reading visual materials? And Ksenia, that is the million dollar question um, for me. So I'm um, bracing to develop a second part of this paper, which I'd always hoped to do, um, which is looking at the clothing in Surikov's Yermak, which, to be honest, at the moment just gives me the fear because it is so congested and problematic and improbable and indefinable. Um, and we, you know, clearly because of the distance, we, by which I mean both contemporary viewers, but also Surikov's viewers when the painting was complete in 1895, it was completed, you know, in the west of the empire. It was exhibited in the Pyridvizhnik um, exhibition of 1895. It, so it went around Western cities, sort of Western imperial cities. Um, it was not exhibited in Krasnoyarsk or in Tumin or in Tobolsk. Um, so, you know, we don't have, and nor did the, his contemporary viewers have, sight of the actual objects that he 
writes in his letters about studying. So he, you know, he travels extensively through different settlements, um, um, sort of pivoting around Krasnoyarsk. But I mean, I went in, in the phenomenal conference that kickstarted all of this, which Val Segui and Joan hosted in Tumin. We had this day, two day trip to Tobolsk and sort of rights of going to the Tobolsk Museum to depict headgear, for example. And I trotted around the, the various museums in Tobolsk praying that, that, that you would suddenly think, oh my goodness, this is what he was working from. Of course, no chance because displays have changed. And there was, there was I found precisely nothing that related to what he would have seen in the collections at that time. So there is this, there's a disconnect um, for us temporally, but for his viewers at the time, geographically, there's a disconnect, which kind of gave him license. If one was being unkind, you could say it gave him license to to do what he wanted. And clearly there's places where he did do what he wants because the the you know the people are depicting in clothing which they would have pulled them out of a boat, for example. <laughs> you know, they would have drowned if they were actually wearing some of that <laughs> stuff. And so how we I mean I you used the word sort of ethical about the use of clothing to get around the problematic ethical issues of dealing just with physiognomy physiognomy. And that there's real ethical issues of dealing with clothing it seems to me because we don't have the the signifiers we don't have them we can't judge we can't assess and I think it also throws up um ways in which we need to extend beyond for the art historians on this call you know Linda Nochlin's famous piece um on orientalism which kick-started so much thinking about orientalism in the visual arts and you know she talks about the the items which which ground oriental painting um, but I'm interested in the ones that upend painting, in the ones that it, it, they kind of they're the ones that cast everything adrift. And I would argue, I mean, I, I am the as you can tell. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm right at the beginning of thinking about this, but I'm I think that the objects in Surikov's painting exemplify ways in which you know it's the opposite of what Linda Nochlin talks about. It's how these things are sort of cast adrift, and we can't fix meaning in the way that presumably he had intended um if you really disagree with me please email me <laughs> i i would love a debate about this i really would whether now or whether there's more time i'd be delighted to talk to people great thank you polly uh, willard would you like to respond yeah sure i can uh, chime in i i just want to say something in relation to yermak and, and surikos uh, rendition whenever i've um, taught the painting i enjoy thinking of a variety of um, stories that might be within it. And one of them actually uh, speaks directly to Yermak's representation with his bold hand pointing to the far bank, pointing to Russia's history of conquest, all the way to the ocean, but also the very fact that he is wearing the chain mail that will ultimately do him in because of course the story is he drowns, attacked by these same fellows, at least some of whom get away from him and find him a few years later and do him in and he can't get out of the water because he's weighed down by this armor or, you know, anyway, so that there's a, I, I, I have no idea whether those uh, things were uh, in Surikov's uh, mind uh, as he played through the various stories that were in the canvas, but uh, something that I, I, I thought uh, is kind of uh, evocative of both the, um, the bright and the dark of the <laughs> imperial story there. Anyway, uh, with, with regard to um, the clothing question in, uh, in, um, uh, Yakim's painting, um, his portrait, self-portrait. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I started my remarks by uh, Im immediately assuming that, based on our experience with images like this, from a broader knowledge of European and and, and North American art influenced by European uh, traditions, we would uh, readily assume that there was a sort of perform performative quality here. You know, this wasn't everyday dress. This was someone dressing up to look like the other. Uh, in this case. Um, you know, part of the um, uh, fun of breaking into the painting and looking for its real meanings is turning what might have been uh, artifice into the ordinary, because this was, in fact, ordinary dress for uh, members of, of the mission. Um, uh, they they, they uh, wore Chinese dress as part of their daily um, uh, lives, and it was the uniform of their work. Uh, supposedly, uh, 
Bichur, and even upon leaving the mission, ultimately returning to the empire, wears his dress throughout his period um, on Chinese or Qing territory, and then only changes into his uh, Russian monkly garb uh, once he's on uh, Russian territory. And we know that other uh, members of the missions across time uh, until the 1860s uh, also represented themselves in, in nowhere near the accomplished way that Bichurin did in this portrait, but in other drawings uh, that are only really available sketches that we can find in manuscripts, including a couple I've seen at the um, uh, sorry, uh, manuscript division of the of the public library in, in, in Petersburg. Um, but what's very interesting about this is that uh, uh, seen in the context of the mission, a kind of granular local knowledge about how authority was constructed in Beijing by these representatives of, of uh, Russia, um, this portrait was speaking to Bichurin's uh, uh, power in his element. I mean, he, he, he had the authority of this position uh, communicated by his dress. But when seen in, in the Russian context, seen in a faraway place like St. Petersburg, he looks like he is orientalizing. Um, um, so uh, um, making sense of his clothing has everything to do with not just his position, but where his clothing is perceived. And he seems to have, based on some of the accounts of people who um, mixed with him in the different salons of St. Petersburg um, of the 20s and 30s, uh, he seems to have occasionally worn Chinese dress in St. Petersburg. And what was he, <laughs> presumably trying to sort of evoke a, a sense of authority for himself as an inter, you know, someone who can interpret China for the for the residents of the Russian capital, but also uh, perhaps gently mocked for that by some of the commentators, at least based on some of the things I've read. Thank you, Willard. That's fascinating. Um, I just wanted to um, take uh, uh, MC's privilege and say um, that what really struck me about uh, one thing of many that struck me about the self-portrait was that uh, he, even though he was in Chinese dress, that he was portraying him, he was avoiding this rigid frontality of the typical Qing and you know traditional Chinese depictions of officials that by choosing to portray himself with that quarter turn and full length, um, he does set himself apart as being non, not Chinese. So it's part of that um, mix of images, that multi-layered image that you um, that you are analyzing. So fascinating. So Wendy, yeah, I just that, that was a a brilliant um, uh, example there, Willard. But the most obvious thing, and and just what thinking about Xenia's question is, clothes are something you take on and put take off and put on. And so clothes are just one of the most unstable things you can really think about with identity. And this is such a perfect example of how you can play with play with clothing when you cross the border. And all it's it's just such an extraordinary example of we tend I think it gets really essentialized. They look like that and they wear they wear those clothes and we wear these clothes. But even just to recognize that you can play, you can dress up and you can play around in clothes. That's that's just an incredibly helpful insight, I think. Thank you. Do we have any other questions coming up? Um, I actually had a question for Olga. Um, I was really interested and by your um, discussion of the changed reception of the uh, of Verishagin's paintings when they were shown in Europe that the, the the suddenly it was Verishagin who was the barbarian. And I was wondering, I'm sure that you discussed this in the, I know that you discussed this a bit in the chapter, but if you'd like to say a few more words about the, uh, the motivation for that, uh, whether do you think it was more uh, about this orientalizing of Russia and the sort of general kind of stereotypes about Russia, or do you think it was more concerns about, um, about Russia as a, as a competition, um, as a, uh, another empire that was in competition with uh, European empires. Thank you for this great question. Uh, I'm not sure I have a definitive answer. What I wrote in my paper, I said today, I wrote today we can um, see those uh, comments uh, and actually, there are more comments than the English uh, reviewer. The Austrian reviewers also the v from Vienna 
uh, when they talked about the, the, his uh, Berishagin's exhibition in Vienna, they actually made very similar uh, poets. Of course, we can take it as a set of prejudices, a kind of poli mod politically and culturally motivated. But for me, it's not that important what motivated them. The most striking thing for me is that the point was embraced. The criticism was readily acknowledged. And it's not very surprising when we're talking about immigrants like Gerson, for example. Gerson always, when he himself, I don't know if he was accused of barbarism by anyone in his Western environment, but he actually very often claimed in the 50s, after a few years spent in uh, London, Paris, and um, other places, uh, he claimed that he was a he was a barbarian. He be, began to develop, elaborate on, on that to to de, to, this, to develop his own Russian identity or Russian being in the West. So, but um, the most interesting thing that uh, Vereshchagin and his circle, Vladimir Stasov, was very instrumental uh, in that. Uh, they were ready to embrace it. And um, to embrace his art as a barbaric art for the Rishagin, it was a sign of a true realism, not uh, refined realism. And for um, uh, for for, for Stasov, I mean, it was a sign of true realism. But for the Rishagin, it was basically it, it just detects to what extent he hesitated to what extent he wasn't absolutely certain about many things. And it's not surprising that some of his paintings were not positively um, accepted. Uh, when he uh, painted the wounded, the soldier who is mortally wounded, wounded his painting was got very critical reception in, in okay. Russia, of course, during the war, who, who wants to uh, hear that. Uh, but uh, he definitely in, had in, increasing concerns about the imperial mission, though we, we, we can test it in many things. And this embracement of barbarism and of being close to the other, to some extent, is very revealing. Have I answered your question? Yes, thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you for the great question. Does anyone else have questions? Or perhaps it's time to move on to some con any concluding remarks that um, the editors or anyone would like to make. Um, oh, we have Christine. Yes, Chris, would you like to? We can, let's see, could somebody get Chris to uh, allow her to unmute? Okay. So since my name was mentioned, I felt like I should say a few things. And that is only to confirm that clothing is, is not stable. It's very, very difficult to understand whether it's in painting or on a person's body, what's going on there? How does this reflect identity? What is what is the message if there is indeed one? And that's one of the things that's so pleasurable about working on it is, is that you can, you know, really grapple with some very interesting questions. But just like this project that uh, Wendy was talking about, there's no, there's no end, there's no conclusion. It's always shifting and it depends on the viewer and, you know, in the case of women wearing fashionable dress or people like um, some of the people who we saw here today who are adopting what's supposedly native dress. Well, what does that mean? And what, what are the messages that are being sent? And I think one of the things that as a human being, if you if you begin to try to understand clothing, all you come up with is questions. And that's why people don't want to deal with it because then it becomes a real issue of, okay, who is this person in front of me? And we so often use clothing as a way of trying to figure that out. And if that call is called into question, then we're all in trouble, which we all are, I would add. So, Ksenia, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, anyone else or any concluding remarks? Um, Elena, we will ask you to unmute. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Well, um, I I decided to raise my hand because um, um, not not because I'm an an expert in the questions of the Russian Empire, but I did have some experience in um, 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 in the uh, area of. Uh, cultural encounters in the 17th century because I did the exhibition the world of 1607 and uh, uh, we explored um, with uh, um, 28 scholars uh, different questions uh, at the age of those expansions there were parts uh, on cultural encounters image of the other in different parts of the world and when it comes to the uh, clothing, um, uh, and uh, I'm, um, the uh, the uh, Villard talk uh, about um, Bichurin, um, I noticed that uh, there are uh, quite close parallels in what was going on in uh, Beijing uh, in the 19th century, uh, uh, comparing to what was going on in the 17th century and of the 16th, uh, uh, beginning of the uh, 17th century, when Jesuit monks traveled to different parts uh, of the world, for example, to Japan, uh, to China, uh, and uh, to um, South America, um, areas of Mexico, and what was going on, uh, and, uh, they were trying to um, collect uh, knowledge, uh, and uh, that's what Bichurin was doing. He was uh, um, an artist, uh, he uh, coll collected uh, knowledge by copying books, uh, or, whatever he did there. Obviously, he was uh, doing this. Uh, at the same time, uh, they were trying to es establish uh, uh, good relationships through uh, transmitting their own knowledge. And um, the sign that they were accepted and they uh, uh, they were lifted in the rank was uh, uh, giving them um, uh, uh, not the chance to dress, but when the, the monk or uh, uh, the um, representer of uh, Jesuits uh, was given uh, Japanese uh, uh, clothing, it was it meant that he was lifted in the, in the rank. It was, it meant that he was accepted. And that was a different dialogue. And the same thing happened in China, and the same happened uh, in uh, in South uh, uh, South America. And um, that was recorded in uh, different uh, uh, different images. So uh, I found it quite uh, quite familiar like looking at this portrait of Bichurin. I, I think I missed uh, the the point uh, who was the target of this portrait was it the Chinese uh, audience or was it the Russian audience because this uh, seems to be uh, important um, and um, also, I had a question to Villard. <clears throat> uh, looks like the uh, mission, uh, Russian mission, was uh, uh, considered uh, quite an important one since it was built uh, within the uh, area uh, of uh, the important area of, of Beijing. But looks like it was built by uh, the the old buildings. They were uh, constructed by Chinese, 
because I noticed the uh, uh, the building on the left back, which is uh, which has a cross on the on the top. Uh, it's supposed to be the church itself, and inside there was a picture. Uh, showing the altar space, uh, it didn't uh, look like the altar space in the um, in the Russian churches. Uh, it doesn't have apsidas and things like this. So probably it was built by Chinese. But uh, the uh, entire thing looks like um, the Bichurin is there, given an important uh, uh, space to leave. He was given important clothing. And at the same time, he is uh, uh, obviously uh, showing the sign of respect to uh, Chinese uh, uh, power by um, <clears throat> uh, following uh, and, and, and wearing their dresses. So it's like going back and forth, but, but this is what Chinese always wanted. They didn't conquer it uh, often. Uh, by by the power, but they were quite happy with the diplomatic. If you show them respect, they're fine with this. That's in the early uh, Chinese uh, history. And uh, I, I have also the remark uh, towards the Verishagin uh, uh, and uh, uh, Surikov and um, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, um, Verishagin and Surikov, uh, as well as Piridvizhniki, were uh, uh, the artists who actually started looking at the uh, mm, uh, genre painting and uh, looking at the uh, uh, historical uh, images and historical clothing uh, from a uh, uh, different point of view. Before, uh, it was uh, types uh, in the historical painting, arch archetypes, uh, not uh, actually uh, the images of real peasants or real or re of real people, just uh, the model and the, some kind of clothing mix of academic understanding what how it's supposed to be but at the time but uh, Peredvizhniki and uh, uh, Surikov and um, Verishagin they started a new wave of uh, um, of the genre and historical painting. That's why there are so many uh, um, etudes, uh, sample studies, portraits, and uh, I absolutely agree with this phrase that uh, Surikov's painting is has more, more uh, look like having more photographs rather than types, which is mm -hmm. absolutely true. Right. And thank you. Yeah. And uh, exactly about the types. And he also very was very, very uh, um, particular about the clothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, <laughs> people can draw in this heavy clothing, but he obviously collected the uh, samples of this clothing or. Uh, meticulously depicted them in his drawings. That's what I Thank wanted. You. Thank you, Yelena. Thank you. Great. So, um, yeah, we have more uh, in the chat for um, for people to read about. Uh, we um, are starting to run short on time. So um, if our editors have anything that they wanted to add. Uh, just thank you to everybody for your comments. Wendy, thank you so much. And Willard, Olga, and Polly, of course, it's wonderful to have you, to, to hear your papers again, and to everyone else for their um, really interesting, insightful questions. Thank you, Than. Thank you to 19V, Margaret, um, and everybody for inviting us to present the book. I hope everyone will go out and um, encourage their library to buy it.
Oh, I know yeah. what I want to say. Actually, I have one little thing, which is that Please. it's available in an in an electronic form. And the electronic form allows you to zoom in and look at details on the images if that's something you want to do. Okay. Thanks. That's great. And yes. The book is not small, but it's well worth it. But yes, get your library to get it too. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank no, you so much. I just Sarah. wanted to add a very brief thanks. And also, Wendy, it you elevated the book so much. It's, it's <laughs> so exciting to see it through your eyes. So thank you oh, so much for, for it didn't need elevating. It was, up, it was it's up it's up there. <laughs> thank you. It is a pleasure. Wonderful. Yeah. It's such a pleasure to read your work and to see it all come together. And thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thank you for uh, the editors, the contributors, and thank you for this important, um, important work that you've produced. So thank you all for your question and the, the discussion. See you next time. Bye, everybody. Yeah.